So, um, yeah, this is live, so we don't actually have the thumbnail up, but when you're watching this video as a VOD, you'll see the thumbnail, and the title is The Scientific Meaning of the Flaming Sword. So, before I, before I talk about tonight's topic, and actually even go into the topic, I want to talk a little bit about what the purpose of the Pathfinding channel is, what, what we're trying to do here. And actually, um, I was thinking this episode is going to be a good example of that. So the point of Pathfinding is, of course, it's kind of in the name, is to help find a path, a guide, a way to a good way to live, both spiritually and physically, and to understand some of the ontological meaning, the nature of reality, some of the, some of the things that are are a bit difficult to understand about life. Development, growth, relationships, why we exist, all the big questions, but even some of the down to earth smaller things. And, um, uh, but, but also, w one of the things that I'm doing here with pathfinding is I'm fusing theology and science. So what pathfinding is trying to establish is something bigger than either of those. That's why a lot of my talks, I might, at least these, these early talks, these first ones I'm doing, I might start out talking about something from the Bible, some metaphor or symbol or seemingly magical thing. And then if you watch some of the previous videos, you'll see that very quickly I veer into evolution or science or biology or, or all those kind of things, chemistry, things in the physical universe that we don't think of as spiritual. And the reason why I do that is because uh, I want to show that there are actually the same principles um, guiding the spiritual things and the physical things. It's just that the language we've been using to describe them has been different. So in, in future Pathfinding talks, some of them I'll be talking about things that are not theological or spiritual at all. Um, like I've got one talk about mental health and depression, but other talks about yeah, evolution and all those kind of things. And in those talks, I might start out on a scientific track and then veer into theological, metaphysical things. And really, uh, the reason is because, in my view, everything is based on the same core principles. And so whether it's theological or spiritual matters or whether it's hard science matters, things of the physical universe, they're actually all expressions, manifestations of the same principle. So that's why... I just fuse them both, talk about them both. Because if you want to talk about a principle or something, you want to show expressions of that principle so that you can see it cashed out in reality. And um, if I show that there's, there's expressions of those principles in the physical world, but also in the way the spirit works, in, in the way that we have a relationship to God, in the way that the heart and relationships work, we can see that everything starts with the same principle and gets expressed in the physical world, and the spiritual the same. Kind of until now, we've had two camps where we see them as being completely different things, almost not related. And um, so that's part of what I'm going to be doing with pathfinding. And so tonight's topic is understanding the meaning of, of the symbol of the flaming sword, specifically the flaming sword from the book of Genesis. And, uh, and so... It looks like just something magical, you know, flaming sword by itself, just waving around. But in actual fact, there's unbelievable um, core principles to it. So let me let me go to this slide here. This scene, yep. Yeah, okay, there we go. And um, so yeah, flaming sword, right? So one of the things, one of the characteristics of pathfinding is I always want to drill down to the mechanics of something, the core mechanics. So when we see sometimes, especially in the Bible, when we see poetic things like, oh, there was a magical flaming sword, we tend to take everything as a symbol. But symbols actually mean something. Symbols represent something real a lot of the time. And um, or we sometimes... Even worse, we take them as just a poetic expression of something nebulous. But I always struggled with that for a long time in my life. And I, I, in fact, I found it frustrating to have to, <laughs> to have to just take some poetic, symbolic meaning that I couldn't get a tangible understanding of. 
If somebody tells me how a clock works, even though I'm not a clockmaker or a car, even though I'm not a mechanic, I can grasp that. I can grasp that the, you get an explosion of gasoline in a car and it causes a piston to move because of pressure. You know, even though I can't really understand combustion engines, I can understand the mechanics of it. So it's comfortable and satisfying to understand those explanations. But when you when you just constantly bombarded with symbols and metaphors and poetry, it can be really kind of hard to get something from it that you can use in your life. And one day I had a kind of an epiphany where I just decided to take things at face value and look at the mechanics of what something is. And it's shocking what you can find when you just look at everything like that, even things like in the Bible. So look at, let's look at the flaming sword and ask ourselves, what are the two characteristics of a flaming, flaming sword? Well, one is it's a sword, so it cuts. And the other is it's on fire. It has fire, it flames, so it burns. So um, let's have a look at... Wait a minute, I don't know if I've progressed there, have I? Let's have a look at some examples of, you know what, I'm not sure which, if I've progressed. Oh, there we go. So let, let, let's have a look at a flaming sword in popular culture, at least. So this character is uh, Beric Dondarrion. So let me just switch the view a little. This character is Beric Dondarrion from Game of Thrones. He worships some kind of fictional uh, god called the Lord of Light. And uh, yeah, when he when he goes to war, he, his sword just bursts into flames. And uh, let's look at another another figure. This is the Witch King of Angmar from the Lord of the Rings. And I read the book when I was a teenager. I don't quite remember if his sword bursts into flames in the book or if that's just the movie. But anyway, here's a, here's a flaming sword from popular culture. And um, we even have, if you look at this one. Luke Skywalker from Star Wars. If you think about it, right, the lightsaber, it's a kind of a flaming sword, isn't it? In fact, it's not a, it's an energy beam. It's not just a piece of metal that cuts. It actually burns and sears through, through things. So the original, the original flaming sword in, pop, in, in culture comes from <clears throat> the book of Genesis in the Garden of Eden. There we see Adam and Eve being cast out of the Garden of Eden, and there's some kind of angel figures, and there's a flaming sword just floating by itself, waving around. And um, this, is what, this is what preceded that. So the left side of this Renaissance artwork picture is kind of like a comic book because it's in sequence. The left side is uh, Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, and there's some kind of serpent, humanoid serpent being. So that's, that's a story where... Um, the serpent tempts Adam and Eve and tells them to, that they should eat the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, even though they're told not to do that by God. So they do that. And then the next, the right side of the picture, you can see, um, well, I'm blocking their faces, aren't I? So the, the right side of the picture, you, you can see Adam and Eve being expelled from the Garden of Eden. Some kind of floating angel type being sticking the sword in Adam's neck, but it's not really on fire, so they, they sort of left that part out. So if we go to the next picture, we can see the actual... Let me just go back to the front image there. We can see the quote in the book of Genesis. So I'm, I'm going to read that. And I'm going to read it a few times throughout this presentation, not to be repetitive, but I think it's, it, it's the core of what we're talking about here. So this is after the events of Adam and Eve eating the fruit and and falling. So um, in Genesis 3.24, it reads like this. After he, God, after he drove the man out, he placed on the east side of the Garden of Eden cherubim and a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. I like to read these, uh, I like to read these twice. After he drove the man out, he placed on the east side of the Garden of Eden cherubim and a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. So what have we got here? We've got um, the man has been driven out, Adam and Eve as well. And then on the, on the east side of the Garden of Eden, God puts these cherubim, kind of angels, and a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. So... 
So here, here we have that image again. So Adam and Eve have been kicked out of the garden. Now, cherubim are kind of angels. Um, there's thought to be different types of angels, like different criteria or species of angels, but cherubim is a certain type of angel. And um, most, most art representations of the scene, uh, most art representations of the scene, they show an actual angel holding the flaming sword. Because after all, that's kind of intuitive, right? If you describe a scene where there's an angel and a flaming sword, then you think, well, the angel must be holding it. In fact, if you look more closely at the verse, it says, he, God, placed on the east side of the Garden of Eden, cherubim, plural, which plural cherubim, I guess it's more than one, and a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. So this indicates that the sword is not even being held by the cherubim. Well, otherwise, it would have said what? It might have said cherubim holding a flaming sword, angel holding a flaming sword. But no, it's just um, there was a flaming sword flashing back and forth. So either there was a literal actual sword just hanging in the air, flashing around with, with the, on fire, or it's a symbol for something. So um, also it's interesting because when people read this verse, they, they usually focus on the idea that the flaming sword is blocking Adam and Eve from the Garden of Eden. They were expelled from the Garden of Eden. When in actual fact, it doesn't say that. It says it was blocking their way to the Tree of Life. Sure, it describes the Tree of Life of being in the Garden of Eden, so it's a, it's a de facto banishment from the Garden of Eden. But we should focus on the fact that it's blocking them from the Tree of Life. <clears throat> so, um, so we, we talked about in a previous pathfinding talk, we talked about... Um, what the tree of life meant, what it represents, the tree of knowledge of good and, and the tree of life. So I'll, I'll sort of encapsulate it here. So the, the tree of life, according to pathfinding, it's not a, an actual tree. And in, in some other theology, like uh, divine principle from unificationism, they, it's described as Adam and Eve, Adam was the tree of life. Because later, you know, later in the Bible, it describes Jesus as a tree of life. And the idea there being that uh, the tree of life is a perfected being like Jesus or a perfected Adam, potentially perfected, if he hadn't fallen. And it's kind, that's kind of correct, but it's not quite correct. Um, it's like the difference be between saying um, a tree or the tree. So a tree is the idea of a tree. So there, there can be many. The tree is, is a specific one. So... Um, a tree of life is basically any entity which exists in maturity according to its design. So it's grown to fullness and maturity, um, which is originally what perfection means. Perfection doesn't mean saintly and on the clouds. It means mature. So a tree of life is any entity which exists in maturity, has grown to fullness and maturity according to its design, and which can take care of itself and generate the energy and resources for its own continued existence in a sustainable relationship with its environment and, and can generate even excess energy, so it has to be very efficient, excess energy in order to foster the growth of offspring so it can multiply itself as well. So that, that's what a tree of life is. So a human being who grows in to become an adult in maturity and is functioning properly so it can exist and continue to exist physically you could say just about any human being on the earth today is a tree of life because they grow up they become an individual entity they go out and get a job they can work and they can take care of themselves they can uh, cooperate with their society and they can generate revenue and they can even foster multiply and foster the growth of their own offspring so that's a tree of life so it literally means um, a being which can sustain life. And, um, but actually, as we talked in that previous pathfinding talk, animals of all kinds are trees of life as well. And tr actual trees <laughs> are trees of life, because that's what they can do, right? They can, they grow up to maturity according to the design, 
They interact with the environment. They can take sunlight from the air for a photosynthesis, nutrition from the ground in osmosis and water, and carbon dioxide from the air. And they can um, continue their existence, and they can even generate energy to put into fruit and seeds for offspring to multiply themselves. That's the tree of life. And even a business, let me just go to actually this one here. Yeah. So even a business could be called, considered a tree of life, right? In the beginning, it operates based on investment, but eventually it grows to maturity. And a business reaches the point where it exists according to its um, purpose and it gets customers and it generates revenue. And so it can con continue to exist and use that revenue to make more products and it can continue to exist. And if it's really successful, it makes so much profit, ex it can generate excess energy that it can actually multiply itself by franchising out or adding more branches. So yeah, uh, a business is a kind of entity. So that's what a tree of life is. A tree of life is any entity like that. And so there, and there's two categories of trees of life. Actually, there's a temporal tree of life and eternal trees of life. So a temporal tree of life would be something like the human body or an animal or a tree. It is a tree of life while it's in its maturity and its lifespan. It can exist and continually do that week, month, year after year. But it has a shelf life. And at some point, it stops becoming a tree of life because it dies. And then the other kind of tree of life is the eternal tree of life, which is God or the human soul. So the idea there being that um, we grow in our human soul and we become trees of life. And that is what Adam and Eve were blocked from. So let me go back to this, this image here. So that's what Adam and Eve were blocked from by the flaming sword. They were, they were adults, just about, <coughs> especially as represented in this picture. And um, so they, they were trees of life physically. They could go out and, and farm and hunt and uh, take care of themselves and have offspring and take care of their offspring. So just like any animal or any tree, they, Adam and Eve were trees of life. Spiritually, um, they were not trees of life. And that's what, that's what it meant when it says, do not eat the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, because in the day that you do, you will die. They didn't die physically, obviously, um, but they died spiritually, meaning they were cut off from God, which is like the source of life. And so the flaming sword was something which blocked Adam and Eve from becoming trees of life. So spiritually, they died. They were unable to grow to maturity and exist. And, and, with, and they, it's called aseity. They were unable to take care of their own self-existence. And so they became like a kind of a shadow of what they were supposed to be. And so, um, yeah. So, so we're asking in this talk, what, what, what exactly does it mean, the flaming sword? What was it that was blocking Adam and Eve from returning to God, and connecting to God and becoming trees of life? And so, yeah, let's have a go back in, into these images and have a look at this next slide then. So I, I like to, as I said, I, I like to read this periodically through this talk just to remind ourselves. Genesis 3.24, after he drove the man out, he placed on the east side of the Garden of Eden cherubim and a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. Okay, so if we look at um, if we look at Matthew ten thirty four, this is something that Jesus said. I mean, we we used to we used to the popular quotes of Jesus where he's being all lovey dovey. We used to see in pictures of Jesus where he's holding a lamb and looking all demure, but we tend not to publicize the parts of Je where Jesus said harsh things or when he went into the temple grounds and actually whipped people or at least they whipped the tables because <laughs> they were doing money changing and money lending in the grounds of the temple. So here's something a little bit um, challenging that Jesus said. Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. So what was it that Jesus was talking about, a sword? And what, how was the connection there to a flaming sword? And what does it mean that he said I have come to bring. I have not come to bring peace to the earth. Peace can just mean no disturbance. Don't rock the boat. No change. But if the world is in hell, then 
you don't want to leave that in peace, do you? You want to cause some kind of revolution of the good kind. And so Jesus came to bring a sword. Now, you might think the usual, the usual way of talking about peace, talking about peace or, 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 bring, or bringing a sword, is, well, there's a peaceful community and Jesus wants to act like a bandit and, and go around attacking people. But obviously, he has a, a diff different meaning to that. So let's have a look at the next quote from Jesus. So here in Luke, sorry, in Matthew, wait, is that right? Yeah, in, in Luke 12, 49, Jesus said, I have come to bring fire on the earth and how I wish it were already kindled. Hmm. So we've got a verse where Jesus is talking about he came to bring a sword and another verse where he's talking about he came to bring fire on the earth. So now we're getting a bit of an insight about the meaning of the flaming sword. So what is it that Jesus actually did when he did his mission? He was basically um, speaking the truth. He was going around speaking the truth, preaching, and obviously saving people. So let's have a so let's have a consideration. Now we're starting to get uh, some kind of insight about this flaming sword. Again, um, yeah, here's, here's, here's the verse again about God placing the flaming sword flashing back and forth. So let's have a look at the thumbnail that I've created for this video. Now, the title, The Scientific Meaning of the Flaming Sword, is something I'm going to veer into. Now I've talked about the, bio, the biblical meaning side, I'm going to talk about the scientific side. So here in this thumbnail I created, we have on the left the human digestive system, in the middle, we've got a representation of a flaming sword. And in the right, we have some kind of statue of justice type, blindfolded, holding the scales. And so these are all the same thing in principle. These are all, or rather, they're all expressions of the same principle. In fact, the flaming sword is a metaphorical expression of a, of a principle. The human digestive system is an actual expression of, that, of the same principle and the Statue of Justice as well. So, um, the Statue of Justice is basically blind, and the idea about the scales there is you put the evidence on the scales, and whichever one outweighs the other, you accept those findings, those truths. And so, that's the idea, it's impartiality, and you just measure things up against each other, and then you go with the results. So. When it comes to digestion, this I could, in fact, I will do a whole pathfinding talk about digestion because it's unbelievably fascinating. Digestion doesn't seem so spiritual, does it? The, the concept of digestion doesn't seem so romantic. In fact, it's a little bit gross. Um, I did have an idea to use more graphic uh, symbol for the digestive system, but it was just a bit too odd looking, so I used this cartoony one. So with, with digestion, um, we, we think of stomach rumbling, right, or bodily functions, or some weird noises, or when you see the guts, they're all kind of gross looking. And, and in fact, if we, look at, if we look at this representation from, from Star Wars, Return of the Jedi, you know, Jabba the Hutt was going to throw Luke and Han and Leia and Chewie into the Sarlacc, which is some kind of big dune-like sandworm that sits under, under the sand dunes, and the threat was, you will be digested in the belly of the Sarlacc for a thousand years. I presume this means the Sarlacc would do something to uh, prolong the life of the victim and then slowly digest over a painful thousand years. So that's what we think of when we think of digestion. But actually, if we think of digestion in another way, now excuse the slightly gross uh, image here, but if we think of digestion in some other way, we can see unbelievable beauty to it. So this is what our in, internal organs look like. At the top there, you've got the liver, and the, the, the beige looking thing there is the, um, the stomach, and then you've got the large and small intestines. And so the digestive system is really interesting. For example, did you know that all food contains poison? Everything is poisonous. 
it doesn't matter how organically grown or how natural it is, no fertilizers, even the, even the purest seeming vegetable, they're all poisonous. And that's why people that have certain organ failure issues, they get poisoned by healthy food. And so, um, so, so the reason we have all these organs in our body is to purify these foods. We eat them in their, in their natural state, even if we cook them, and they have a mix of nutritious things and poison in them. And then our body separates the poison and our body gets rid of the poison and retains the nutritious part. So, um, yeah, that's how it works. But I, I, actually, digestion, digestion begins way before the food goes into our stomach. Initially, well, not even initially, but, but before that, digestion happens in the mind. So we go to the supermarket or the hypermarket and we see things. We see chairs and tables for sale and books and food. And we discriminate between them. I can eat this food. I can't eat these books. I can't eat these chairs or table. So we're already digesting. We're already separating and categorizing based on a criteria. The criteria being not what's delicious, that motivates us, but the criteria is what is healthy for us, what's nutritious for us. And so we discriminate between all these other items and food, and we select food. But actually, digestion occurs way before that process as well. So digestion is um, programmed into our genes. So when we smell delicious food and we feel a great desire for it, and it smells lovely and we want to eat it, and then we smell other things like, I don't know, animal feces or, or something that's just not a food substance, and we either feel disgust or we don't feel anything at all, like smell a stone or a piece of wood, we don't feel any desire to eat it. That has been programmed into our genes over millions of years through evolution. So that, digestions, that digestive system, that system of taking everything and breaking it down and separating and categorizing and getting rid of things and, cons and absorbing other things, that is already programmed into our genes. So we, we pretty much know what to eat and what not to eat. And then we have to use other criteria such as, you know, nutrition evidence. So, <clears throat> yeah. So, so, so first we, we have it programmed in our genes. Then, then, we character, then we categorize what to hunt and gather in the pre-agrarian age, and these days, what to buy from the, the supermarket. Um, and, then we, and, then, um, and then we chop it up and we separate all the, the shell and the rind and those kind of things. So we're already categorizing and separating. This is, this is good, I want to keep this, this is bad, just separate it off and throw it away. And then we consume it. And then, as I said, even after we consume it, we, it's, it, all food has poison and toxins in it. So first we chew it so we can break it down. So by chewing it, what we're really doing is not just so we can swallow it, it's so we can break it down more. And then once it's all broken down, it goes into our stomach. Then our stomach produces acid. It breaks the food down even more to a really a chemical level. And then all our intestines, that you see here, these beautiful, ugly, weird-looking intestines, they go through a process of categorizing and, and separating. And then eventually, at the end of the process, it's all separated into two main groups. That which is nutritious for the body and good for us. All right, let's just go back to the full picture. And that which is either negative, to a negative effect on our body, or it's just no effect at all, neither good nor bad, which itself is a negative because we have to spend energy to process it. That's a net loss of energy. And so... Um, and then what do we do? We take all the stuff that's either toxic or not good for us or of no use to us, and our body expels it through urine or through the bowels or maybe even through sweat or pimples. It just gets rid of it. So it categorizes, right? It categorizes the stuff that's negative and gets rid of it. And the stuff that's good for us, we absorb it into our body. It gets burned up to use for energy. It gets broken down and used to replace our body parts. So 
the food, at least part of it, actually becomes us. <clears throat> How do you think children get get bigger from being tiny? Because they they eat the food, and then the food becomes them. So it's really true when you say when when they say you are what you eat. In fact, if you think about it in a kind of a strange way, our internal organs. If I can just go back to this weird picture, our internal organs are a little bit like the roots of a plant. Only, only the roots of this human plant is on the inside. And instead of the plant being uh, planted in the earth with the roots in the earth, we, we bring the earth, we bring the earth to us. And we categorize what part of the earth, the animals or the plants on the earth we want, and we put it into our stomach where the roots are. And then the roots break it down and then transport that energy to the rest of the body. So in principle, it's, it's a little bit like the roots of a plant is our stomach. Our stomach is constantly, two or three times a day, connected to the earth, either to the animal kingdom or to the plant kingdom, um, by us transporting the earth to our insides. So that's, that's the principle. And, and even, even the other organs, even the other organs in the body, such as human kidney, they also operate on the same micro principle as the macro of the, of the whole digestive system. So the, the human kidney, kidney removes, it removes waste, extra fluid from the body, removes acid produced by the cells, and it maintains a balance of water, salts, and various minerals. So again, what is the kidney doing? Like all the other organs, it's categorizing. What does this body need? What is negative for this body? It has a criteria before it even does that, and the criteria is what's healthy for this particular human body, this, um, this design. And then it applies that criteria, and it finds all the substances that are not healthy, either neutral or negative, and it separates them off, and it trashes them and get rid of them, gets rid of them, and it keeps and absorbs the stuff that it does need. And um, and if you look at uh, you know the the, path, the pathfinding talk I did uh, some weeks ago, all of he evolution, this is kind of like the what I call the tree of knowledge of good and evil of all of evolution all bacteria and all the different plants and fungi and all the different kinds of life going all the way up to all the different types of animals, amphibian, reptiles, birds, mammals. So um, all of these have gone through the same process. This is one giant process. The evolution is one giant process of the flaming sword. In other words, every single thing here had to develop a system where it could categorize what works for me, what doesn't work for me, what works for my species and what doesn't work, and get rid of what doesn't work and incorporate what does work. Any species or any type of life form that couldn't do that just went extinct and disappeared. And so, <clears throat> and this is, um, this is, this is how, th this, this is how it kind of works. And I showed this graph that I made in, previous pathfinding about the tree of knowledge of good and evil and it was really a way to understand a different way of thinking about why there's suffering in the world right so what we what we want to avoid is death in fact every being every human being apart from those with you know mental health issues or emotional issues every, every human being wants to avoid death so does every animal so does every plant or every other kind of life form and um so we, we can suffer damage, but when we suffer damage, we change our behavior. So based on the criteria of wanting to, to avoid death and be alive, we experience something which causes damage. And so we get rid of that experience. And we, well, I'm not going to do that again. So we discard that experience, don't we? And then we say, I want to do other things which don't cause me damage. And then even before we get damaged, we're lucky enough that we have this sort of virtual damage, which is pain. We think, we think why is there pain in the world? Why, why would God or nature create a, a system where people can feel pain? 
And um, let me just go to this chat. And, and, and basically, hey, hey, Brooker. Sorry, I didn't see the chat until now. So, so, so basically, we, we have this amazing system. All, all animals do as well. But we don't even have to feel damage. We can feel a, a sort of a premonition of damage, which is pain. And again, when we, when we suffer pain, we again have the criteria, the flaming sword criteria. We, we categorize what, by what criteria do I want to apply to my life? And that is, I don't want to die. I don't want to be damaged. I don't even want to be in pain. And so we use this criteria to analyze any situation, any experience, and the experiences that result in pain, damage, or death, we get rid of and we say, I don't want to have that experience again. I want to have the experiences with the opposite of that. And um, yeah. has it changed? I just want to... Yeah, there we go. And we even have a pre antecedent precedent to, to, to pain, which is anxiety. So pain sucks. So even just even the sense that pain is imminent causes us anxiety. So it gives us another another opportunity to apply the flaming sword. You're in a situation or you're doing something and you start to feel anxiety, you think this is gonna be bad, I'm gonna this is gonna hurt, or this is gonna even cause damage. And so again we apply the criteria and we get rid of that kind of situation or experience or, or behavior. And uh, then we have we have a choice, of course. And wisdom is the criteria. Criteria means you could say knowledge it doesn't have to be wisdom. Um, the, the criteria is understanding life, understanding myself, understanding what's safe or what's good, what leads to life and not death. And so we apply the flaming sword. We don't do the behavior which causes anxiety, pain, damage, or even death. And we do, we do behavior which we know will, instead of anxiety, we feel anticipation. Wow, I've done this behavior. Like, for example, I've worked out at the gym, right? We don't necessarily feel any stronger. In fact, you might even feel weaker because you're exhausted or you've dieted or you've studied, done your homework or you've done a great, great job at work. And so you feel anticipation instead of anxiety. Something good's gonna come as a result of that. And then you feel pleasure, right? You either ate healthy food and you feel pleasure from it or you um, worked out and then later you feel stronger and healthier. That gives you pleasure. All the, all the good things we do in life that lead to the tree of life, we, we feel good as a result. And as a result, we actually grow. We don't just stay the same even though we did the, the right thing, we actually improve and grow. And that leads to a state of being alive. It doesn't have to be physical life of, of a being like an animal or a human. It can be a relationship that's a living relationship, either with God or with our spouse or with our friends or family. Uh, or it could be even the life, of, you've heard the phrase, the life of the party, right? Oh, this party's dead, this party's alive. So, um, so yeah, so this is what I call the tree of knowledge of good and evil. You have these experiences, you apply the flaming sword, and the result, the fruit of that tree is the tree of life. So this is, um, we have inherited wisdom, which is, for example, uh, <coughs> which is, for example, guidance from your parents or from your teachers or from your elders or your friends. Uh, so we don't need to do the trial and error. We can just accept, well, that, that makes sense. Yeah, don't take heroin or, or don't, um, you know, a married man, don't sleep around or a married woman or, you know, don't drive at 120 miles an hour on the motorway. You know, we don't have to do that to know that that's good advice to take. And then there's another way, which is trial and error, inductive wisdom. And that means we, we try certain things out. Uh, maybe a kid goes skateboarding without knee pads or a helmet and gets grazed. And then they realize, yeah, that, that was stupid. I should have worn uh, knee pads and elbow pads. And so that's trial and error. And, um, and yeah, I like to... I like to mention this verse from Deuteronomy 30, 19. I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Now choose life. So this is the Bible. This is God describing this process. So I'll just apply, I'll just apply to the, the flaming sword. 
I'm trying to establish this principle that the flaming sword, in, as, as mentioned in Genesis, wasn't an actual sword. It wasn't. It's a metaphor for the principle by which we apply a criteria to something and get either a good result or a bad result. So let, let's look at some examples. I'll start with a bit of a funny one. So this is um, this is washing the dishes, something I used to hate to do when I was younger. My sister once came to my, my flat the first time I lived by myself, and there was just a mountain of dirty dishes in my sink. I used to just, when it's time to eat, I used to just take the top plate and wash it <laughs> and then use that. But, you know, now I love, I can't stand seeing dirty dishes in a sink, so I'd love to wash them. So, yeah, when we wash the dishes, we're actually applying a flaming sword. And so I like to use this, sim I like to use this simple example of how this is so. So when we wash the dishes, we basically use three different um, techniques at the same time. So we use heat, right, hot water. We use chemical abrasion with a detergent. And we use pressure. Scrubbing, scrubbing the dishes. And what are we actually trying to achieve? So basically our criteria is that we want to have dishes and cups and plates and knives and forks that are clean, free of bacteria, free of uh, any contaminants, so it's completely clean. And that way it's healthy for us. We're not going to get sepsis or, or some kind of other illness from the bacteria. So we want to, after eating, we want to clean these things and make them completely free of all the food. Even though the food relatively was healthy when, when it's fresh, if it hangs around on the plates and cups, it, it's going to mold and decay and then it's going to be dirty and it, and it could cause sickness. So yeah, we want to have completely clean dishes. That is our criteria. So how do we go about this? We take these dishes and plates and, and things and we put them in an environment or through a process whereby the plates and dishes and cups can survive, but the things that are on them, such as the leftover food and the bacteria and things, maybe the dried up soup that's in, inside the bowl, can't survive. So what do we do with that? We put hot water, water on it, and then we put chemicals on it, and then we rub a rough sponge over it and through doing this process, it doesn't harm the plates or the cups and knives and forks at all, but it dislodges all the dirt and it gets them off. So that's our criteria, right? We've got one whole thing, which is dirty plates and dishes. And our criteria is we want to keep the dishes, but get rid of the dirt, right? You heard the phrase, don't throw out the baby with the bathwater. The baby's a valuable thing. The bath water is the thing that we no longer desire, it's the dirty water. And so in the, in the case of plates and dishes, we want to keep the plates and dishes in a clean state, and we want to get rid of the, um, the dirt and the bacteria. That is our criteria. So we, that is the flaming sword. So what we do is we want to, the flaming sword, remember, cuts. So what are we doing? We're dividing into two, two categories, the dirt, and the dishes, so cuts and burns. Burning just means destroying or discarding or getting rid of. So when we put the dirty dishes in the sink, we're applying the flaming sword. We're using the soap and the heat and the pressure as a method of cutting, separating, <laughs> separating the, the dirt from the dishes. And then we're using the water to wash away and discard and, and it goes down the drain and we get rid of the dirt, right? So cut. First categorize what, what part of this hole we want and don't want, then separate them and discard. That's what the flaming sword does. Let's look at, um, am I looking at the right camera? I'm not, am I? I've got this bad habit of looking at the wrong camera. Sorry about that. So, well, let me change to that camera. So I am looking at the right camera. So let's, let's look at um, another example then. So that's it, a simple example of the dirty dishes. Okay, change. Okay, sorry, I meant to change that. So, so, so that's an example of dirty dishes. Let's look at a little bit of a more serious example, right? So here we've got an example of um, radiation therapy and chemotherapy. And, it, you know, this is a tragic topic when people have to have these treatments. 
But it's also damn fascinating, actually. Um, because when, you, when people have leukemia or other kind of cancers in their bodies, they, we use the flaming sword to cure them or to fix them or to, to make them well. And what is that flaming sword in this case? The flaming, the flaming sword is that we, um, we have a criteria, which is we want this person to be healthy. And we identify within that person what part is the person, the healthy body, what part is the foreign element, not really foreign because it's developed by the body cancer, but I think you understand my meaning. What, what part is the undesirable part? And then we want to separate the person, the healthy person, from the cancer and then get rid of the cancer. Again, the flaming sword cuts and burns. So in the case of some cancers, they get radiation therapy. So we actually poison the person. And in the case of chemotherapy, we actually drip poison, red, red, radi radiated, radiated, is that right? Yeah. Radiated chemicals into their bloodstream. So we basically poison people. And the idea being that we poison them to the degree that the human body can survive, even though it gets weakened and weakened and weakened, it can survive, but the cancer cannot survive. So we put the hole into a situation where we can separate the cancer from the person by killing the cancer. So again, we separate and discard. Again, it's the same flaming sword principle which was expressed in the Old Testament in the Bible all those years ago. We see it everywhere in nature, in the digestive system, washing the dishes in the treatment of cancer. And ironic, uh, not ironically, amazingly, the other thing about cancer is, for example, when people have uh, cancer in the, in the marrow, in the bone, they get radiation treatment, so it actually destroys and kills all the marrow in their body. The marrow is where the blood is made. So I guess that's cancer's leukemia, right? So the mar marrow inside the bones is where the blood is manufactured, where it's made. But when they have that, that cancer of the blood, we kill it, kill the whole system with radiation therapy. And then we do an operation on a healthy person who's compatible and we take some marrow from their bones and seed it like a seed. We seed it inside the marrow of the patient. And then, but we have to first bring that patient down so they're almost dead and all the cancer's dead, luckily just before the person dies. And then we seed the marrow and then the marrow multiplies and bring them back to health. And um, yeah, so we basically engraft that person to a healthy person. And that's also a concept of engrafting from, uh, from the Bible. So let's look at this next example from the natural world of the flaming sword principle. The next example is the Japanese giant hornet. And this is actually quite amazing. So on the left there you see, um, let me jump over to, yeah. On the left there, you see a humongous Japanese giant hornet. And these exist in colonies. And uh, what they like to do is find a bee colony. So on the right, you see the Japanese bees. And these hornets like to find a bee colony. And each hornet is way bigger, like 10 times bigger than the bees. So what they do is the hornets will go and find the bee colony. Then they will go back and tell all their mates where the bee colony is. And then 20 or 30 of the Japanese giant hornets will come back to the bee colony. And one by one, they'll grab each bee and just bite its head off until they've gone through the entire bee colony and killed them all. Then they'll go in and they'll just steal all the larva and just uh, take them back to, to feed their colony. So what actually happens when the first hornet finds these bees, the bees know that if that hornet escapes, it's going to tell all its mates and come back and then they're done for. So when, when they have an intruder, this initial scout hornet is looking around and it's discovering, oh, this is a bee colony. All the Japanese little tiny honeybees just dive on it and they smother its entire body and just pile on it like hundreds and hundreds of them pile on, on this hornet. 
They don't bite it or sting it or, or try to damage it. Instead, what they do is they start vibrating their own bodies, just shaking, vibrating their bodies. And as they vibrate their bodies, hundreds of hundreds of little Japanese uh, bees vibrate their bodies, their body temperature starts to rise. And so this, this giant hornet is just smothered with all these hundreds of honeybees, and they're all like vibrating their body, and the temperature started to rise. And it's rising and rising, and this is uh, detrimental to both the hornet and the, the bees themselves. But luckily, luckily for the bees, the bees can survive up to a, a temperature of 48 degrees. You know, beyond 49 degrees and the bees would start to die. So, but they can survive up to 48 degrees. But the hornet, the giant hornet, um, can only survive up to 46 degrees. So what happens is the giant hornet gets cooked to death by all the Japanese bees that are just vibrating their bodies and generating heat. And so they kill it by cooking it to death. Uh, it sucks for the hornet, but hey, why have sympathy? Because the hornet was about to come back and just basically murder them all. So, um, so here we see, again, right? We, we see this uh, flaming sword principle. So the bees, their criteria is we want to we wanna survive, right? We don't want this hornet. We want us. We want to survive. And so they create an environment. They create a situation where... They want to separate off and get rid of this giant hornet. And they, they basically put this giant hornet in a situation where the desired result, the desired um, component, the bees, can survive the treatment, but the honeybee, the, the hornet can't survive. And that is temperature of 47, 47 degrees. So in that temperature of 47 degrees, the desired components can survive and the, the undesirable can't survive. So it, it's kind of um, a way to separate, categorize, separate and discard. So it, it's amazing, isn't it, that, <clears throat> that such a seemingly poetic, uh, uh, apocalyptic image from thousands of years ago in the Old Testament actually is a universal principle and let's have a, let's have a look at this this image from the from the Old Testament it's an art representation of the Israelites in the desert prior to after escaping Egypt and prior to going into Canaan of them doing a burnt offering now there's many different kinds of burnt offerings but basically this is how it would go so they would take a, a sacrificial animal for a burnt offering but they wouldn't just kill it and just throw it on a fire and just burn it, offer it up in smoke form, what they would actually do is they would sacrifice the animal, then they would chop it, divide it, chop it up, and then they would burn some parts of it, and then they would cook and eat the other parts. So they would take certain parts of the animal and just destroy it, get rid of it. And then they would take another part of the animal and then they would, after cooking it, they would consume it, and share it out like a giant picnic. So what's going on here? Because all this stuff in the Old Testament culture with the Israelites was very symbolic, just like the flaming sword is. So they're actually enacting in a more symbolic form the flaming sword principle. And that is that you've got the whole, and the whole has some aspect which is not desirable and some aspect which is desirable based on a criteria of what we want to absorb and we want to reject. We divide, flaming sword cut, right? Divide and destroy one part and eat and absorb and incorporate into ourselves the other part. So so, so really this, this is... Um, this. this this uh, ritual is, is a symbolic metaphor, it's a symbolic representation of what was to come. So, which is, so yeah, in the Old Testament, we can see God using this again and again. And 
the idea is we do it sim they did it symbolically with the sacrificial animals but the ultimate goal is to do it do it to our souls and the reason why we want to do this to our souls is because we want to become trees of life we want to become mature beings according to our design like spiritually i'm talking about not physically and ensure that we have energies to exist for for forever in a relationship with god adam and eve were unable to do this they fell we can talk in, a, in another video about what that what the mechanics of that was actually what the mechanics of uh, the fall was why it is that adam and eve destroyed their souls even though they continued existing and all their descendants us have inherited what we call sin which is actually a mechanical sickness of the soul which continues generation after generation and um and so adam and eve were unable to apply the flaming sword to their lives the first the first indication of the flaming sword was don't eat the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil now what that fruit was and what it actually meant is for another talk but the point is that was the criteria don't do this and you will live and you'll be become spiritually perfect and live for eternity if you do it you'll die so what adam and eve did was they did the thing they shouldn't do instead of doing the thing they should do instead of applying the flaming sword categorizing don't do this decide separating the good from the bad doing the good and not doing the bad they did the opposite they did the damaging thing and they got damaged and that's why it talks about in the verse that i read a flaming sword blocking their way to the tree of life it means the flaming sword they couldn't apply this principle to their lives so they couldn't become perfect beings let's uh We'll look at the next one. and that's the concept of adulteration and purification if adam and eve didn't fall there wouldn't have been a need to purify themselves because they were already pure but they adulterated their spirits and so this concept of the flaming sword is the method the mechanical scientific method by which human beings purify ourselves and that's what religion really is basically and that's where we come up with this phrase separating the wheat from the chaff Wheat is the part of the wheat plant that we can eat that's nutritious and food. Chaff is just the plant part that's not really nutritious for us. And um, yeah, even, even old agrarian farmers, they have ways to separate the wheat from the chaff. One way is they throw it up in the air and the wheat's heavier than the chaff. So what do they do? They create an environment, a situation where the wheat can remain, but the chaff will be blown away by the wind. It's a, again, it's a criteria for uh, separating what's good for us and what isn't good for us. So, yeah, this, this flaming sword, what does it actually mean then? Let's get to the crux of this talk. It basically, it, it represents truth. Now, there, there's lots of kinds of truth. Truth is, truth is something that's true, but there's lots of kinds. So, um, so, Sorry, let me just change the camera angle. So, so specifically, the flaming sword represents the criteria to the correct way something functions. So that's how we start. We start with the criteria. What's, what way does this thing function and what's good for it? When people buy a new car, they need to know, right, what to put in the fuel tank. You put petrol in it. You don't put uh, pure oil in it. Or you don't put water in it, right? So they have a criteria for what's, what's, good, for, what's good for the car. And so um, then we can use that criteria for operating a car properly or in nutrition, we use the criteria, right, for what's good for our lives. And we, we use the, the criteria that every step we take in life, we decide this is good for us, it's not good for us, right? This is the, my, I've got my criteria for my career, for my nutrition, for my exercise, for my relationships. There's a criteria and we apply the criteria to our life multiple times a day at every stage we actually use this flaming sword principle so this can be physical things but it can also be spiritual things relationship things and um so basically the flaming sword in in the case of adam and eve means 
It's the Bible. And when I say the Bible, I don't mean the Bible itself is the flaming sword, but some of the truths and the principles and the guidances in the Bible are the flaming sword. They, they teach us how to live, how to make proper relationships. For example, monogamy is one, or um, the Ten Commandments are flaming swords, right? It's telling people, don't lie in court, don't bear false witness, right? Just honor your parents, right? don't steal. Don't, all sorts of things that are helping you to understand what to separate, what not to do, what to do. And um, so, yeah, if you're a Christian, you think of that in terms of, of the Bible being the flaming sword. But if, if you're not a Christian, and even if you are a Christian, then it's just as true, it's equally as true, that medic, modern medical textbooks are also flaming swords. What do they do? They, they have a criteria. What is, what is it that leads to the health of a human body? Either maintaining health or, or a human body that's sick, how do we bring it back to health? And then based on the criteria and the knowledge of modern medicine, right, we, we separate off the behaviors that are bad or the treatments that are no good and, and the treatments that are good. And then we get rid of the quack theories that maybe we thought in the past were, were good for us. Um, and we get rid of them, discard them. So we separate, right? We do experiments, empirical experiments in medicine, and we figure out what works, what doesn't work. So what we're doing, we're separating those two Two things, and then we just get getting rid of of the things that don't work. That's the that's the flaming sword, and it's also true that a book on physics or chemistry or biology or cosmology, they're also flaming swords. And um, the reason why we have such an amazing modern world with all the technology we have is because this flaming sword was applied in the past. There was no understanding of how the world works. So there was no criteria. Well, there was a criteria, which is we want to have a pleasant environment, a safe environment, but there was no knowledge. But because of science and physics, we can separate those things. I could easily add to this slide a picture of a book on nutrition. That would be the same. That's actually an excellent example. Book, a book on nutrition is, uh, has a criteria to be healthy for the human body, slightly different one for different animals. And we um, look at all the different types of food, not just the types of food, but the amounts of food, the timing of food, and we divide into two groups. We, we cut, the flaming sword cuts, right? It divides. This food is junk food. It's going to harm you. You might not feel like it immediately, but all those times it's going to harm you. you know, I'm addicted to sugar, so I give up sugar completely because I know it harms me even though I like it. So this food is bad for you and it's going to harm you, and this food is healthy for you. So again, the flaming sword, based on a criteria, it cuts and it gets rid of, it destroys one part and incorporates the other part. So, um, let's some the physics. Uh, yeah, so let me read, let me go right back to the beginning and just read this again, All right? Genesis 3.24 <clears throat> After he drove the man out, he placed on the east side of the Garden of Eden cherubim and a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the Tree of Life. So, this is what the flaming sword is. Adam and Eve, although they remained alive, they adulterated their spirits by what they did. You know, it, it, it said God was angry because Adam and Eve disobeyed them and ate some apple or some fruit. There's no way all human beings, God's precious children, could be destroyed because they were a little bit disobedient. It's the nature of children to be disobedient, even to a, to a serious degree sometimes. Parents are not going to damn them and all their descendants for thousands of years because of that. So. It was a mechanical thing. It wasn't a legalistic thing that Adam and Eve did something that they shouldn't have done. And then, as a result, they were punished, and so were the descendants for thousands of generations. No, it was, it was something mechanical. Adam and Eve did something that damaged their soul deep, deep inside. It damaged their soul so badly 
that even their children inherited that damage. And you might think that's crazy. If you think legally, you might get a little bit angry at the suggestion of it. It's not fair that their children would be punished, but not everything's not everything happens from a legalistic reason, mechanics reason. For example, if some people got terrible, terrible radiation poisoning, it could actually do something to their genes so that their children from multiple generations could be born with some sicknesses. Right? That's a mechanical thing. It's, it's, not a, it's not really a moral thing. The children are not born with the guilt. They're born with the consequences and that has to be fixed. Uh, in that's, that's why pathfinding always focuses on mechanics. That's why when I, when I started this podcast, this, uh, this live stream, this video, very first episode, I just said mechanics, mechanics, mechanics. And I said it for the first three episodes because I really wanted to drive that home. And so um, that's why when I looked at the flaming sword, I wanted to know what was the mechanical meaning behind that flaming sword. Because it's just amazing how many things in the Bible related to actual practical mechanical things. And when you stop seeing them as just poetry, you can see some unbelievable wisdom in there. And so, yeah, the flaming sword is a principle. And it's the principle of there's a criteria for what's a good version of something and a bad, bad a sickly, deathly version of itself. And in order to apply that criteria to ourselves or to anything, to our business or to anything, we have to be able to categorize, this is good for me, this is bad for me. We have to be able to categorize, and, and then the thing with bad, we don't literally burn it with fire, but we reject it, we discard it, we get rid of it, we flush it, right? We burn it, we destroy it. And then what remains is good, is good for us. And so that is the meaning of the flaming sword in the book of Genesis, in the Bible flaming sword that blocked Adam and Eve from the tree of life. Tree of life being, from it blocked Adam and Eve from becoming a being that is self-sustaining spiritually. And it's not that it blocked them, it's that there's just reality, just like there's gravity, right? If you jump out of a plane without a parachute, you're going to fall down and hit the ground and die. You weren't punished by anything, the ground didn't kill you. Um, there's a criteria to everything and there's a characteristics to everything. And there's certain ways, certain mechanical ways, natural laws to the spirit just as there is to the body. We talk about the laws of nature, but also there's the laws of supernature. Supernatural things have laws, like spiritual things have laws and logic and mechanics no different from those in, in the physical world. And that's why I talked in the beginning of this talk about how pathfinding is going to unify this idea that the things of the spirit and the things of the physical, scientific, material world, they're all based on the exact same principles. They're just expressions of the same principles. And so just because, just as we, um, we see things in the physical world and we just assume that there's a mechanical design to them, even things that we haven't figured out yet, even like on the quantum mechanics level or it's just things in the natural world and even in biology that we just still don't understand how to fix and how, how to operate. We don't think, oh, well, that's because it must be magic. No, we, we assume it's definitely got a mechanical structure to it, that we just haven't learned how to master it yet. So, so pathfinding is showing that this is no different in the spiritual things. It's just that Spiritual things are less visible. They're not as easy to do experimentation with, but we can experiment with them and see the results. We can see that when society, when individuals behave in a certain way, that they, they benefit from it. For example, I'm, on, I'm currently on day 36. Of, I like to do like 40-day routines where I make sure I don't eat any sugar at all no sweets, nothing, and I exercise every day, and I read scripture every day, and I pray every day, and what else do I do? I do some writing in my book that I'm, I'm writing, and um, <clears throat> so I, I do all those productive things in, in a block, actually, all at the same time, one after the other. I do them every day, and I make sure I do them every single day for 40 days. 
you know, it's kind of like a set period with a determination. And at the end of it, I'm going to bake myself a Victoria sponge cake <laughs> as a reward. But um, after 40 days of no sugar at all. And so I can see evidence as clear as day, just like any scientific empirical test. I can see evidence. I become happier. I become healthier. I become more stable emotionally. Um, I feel more in touch with God. Uh, I feel my spirit is more alive. That's to me. That's empirical evidence, and I, and I've been way up and down so many times in my life that uh, it's not it's not a coincidence or a fluke. When I when I don't take care of my nutrition, I don't take care of my spiritual life, my relationship with God, I don't care, take care of my health, I become miserable actually, and even feel physically bad. And so um, so yeah. Even though we can't see many things of the spirit, we can't see relationships either. We can't see love. It's funny. People say they want to get proof that God exists. That's another talk I'm going to give. But there's no proof that anybody loves anybody. But we know it's true. We know we know love exists. And so uh, pathfinding is about reconciling the scientific, natural, physical world and the spiritual world. And I think the way to do that is to show that there are logical principles by which the spirit exists. And yeah, it's amazing that we can look to a 3000 year old book, the Bible, and find a, a symbol of something like the flaming sword. And then as I've talked about, in this talk, there are, there are just so many ways in which that is expressed in the natural world. So it's basically a scientific principle even though it's used in a spiritual story about the fall of men. And so that's what I'm going to be doing with pathfinding. This season, as I've said before, is called season zero. So this is, what is this episode four? Season zero of pathfinding. It's because this is the first time I'm giving these talks. I'm giving them live. And so um, I don't necessarily feel I'm doing the best job of explaining these, these, these ideas, uh, but I'm sort of doing them live to put the pressure on myself. So that I have to speak extemporaneously to a certain degree with a few notes and a few slides. Uh, but then every time I give these talks, I'll refine them and improve them. And so, yeah, I hope uh, I hope you got something from that. You can, you, this is done as a live stream, but then I upload it to YouTube. So it's on Facebook, YouTube and Twitch. So you can you can see uh, Pathfinding on, on the Facebook Pathfinding page, on the Twitch. It's called Life Pathfinding. Somebody's already got Pathfinding, and on YouTube. There's, there's several um, YouTube channels, but you're probably watching it on YouTube anyway. So, yeah, give us a comment and tell us what you think about what you've heard in this talk. And I'll be doing a talk almost, I skipped last week, but I'll be giving a talk almost every Tuesday at 7 p.m. It's five minutes late today. But then it's uploaded as just a video, so anybody can watch it anytime. So we've got, I have about 50 more talks to give maybe more, and there's some really fascinating ones. Some of them are just going to be pure science. And uh, yeah, so thanks for watching, and I'll see, let me just find, I've got to do the big sign off here. So is uh, yeah, I'll, I'll see you next week, next Tuesday at 7 p.m. UK time, and we'll have another Pathfinding talk. So take care. Like that's a, one of those awkward endings where you don't actually end. All right, yeah, take care. <laughs>